Hi, this is Kelsey Fry with MUATV.com here at the International Makeup Artist Trade Show with Mike Elizalde. How are you? I'm doing great. Academy Award nominee with him and Tom Flouts. Tom Flouts. Tom Flouts for Hellboy 2. Now this is going to sound like, I'm just saying it for the interview, but interestingly enough, I fell in love with Hellboy and when I watched it the first time, you know, I'm not you know, I'm not a fan of necessarily alien and prosthetic movies, but I watched Hellboy and I really loved the movie because there was an emotional tone through it. You know, you kind of fell in love with the initial story of how he came about and, and you know, he's, uh, that Ron Perlman is a, just a real, uh, it's a, there's an emotional uh, aspect to him as a character. So I really kind of then fell in love with everything that came with Hellboy 1. Uh, then Hellboy 2, I didn't have an opportunity to see it, and how about that on the plane ride over, I got to, pick, <laughs> I got to pick the movie and I got to watch it. So Aaron and I were sitting watching it, so um, I did have a chance to see it. So congratulations. Thank how do you, you feel? Much. Let's ask you how you feel first. I'm delighted. I'm just overwhelmed and, and just very, very humbled by the whole experience. Very proud of my, my crew, you know, if it weren't for them. Who is your crew? Let's happen. talk about your crew. Well, uh, on Hellboy... Because you, you are the creator of Spectrovision. Spectral Motion. Spectral Motion, yeah, I'm sorry. Not at all. Excuse uh, me, Spectral no, Motion. No worries. Spectral Motion is our company. My wife, Mary, and I own the company together. Mm -hmm. And uh, our crew was, was very big. We had a very, very large crew. What is big in a crew like that? We had about 60 people working on, on Hellboy 2. Wow, that yeah. is a nice, you're a nice employer. <laughs> <laughs> That helps I, I in think, the industry that's so. a little slow, you know? Yes. That's yeah, good. Yeah. So, so it was a pretty, pretty good sized crew. Uh, some of the key people that, that we had uh, were Norman Cabrera, who designed the Angel of Death character. Uh, we had um, Mark Satrakian, who was the mechanical engineer who oversaw all of the animatronic aspects. Uh, you know, Tom, of course, Tom Flouts was on, on our crew, and he traveled to Budapest with me. He did all the work there with us for six months. Very is it sleep. six months in, in total that it takes from the inception and the design and the tests and post-production? What, the, what no. is the time table that it takes to really begin and finish your participation in the collaborative effort of Hellboy 2? Well, just the set part of it, shooting the movie took us six months. The you know, daily application of the makeups, the puppeteering, all of that stuff, that was a six-month process. And then prior to that, we had about eight to nine, maybe almost almost a year of prep, not quite a year. Uh, so all told, it, it was about a year and a half uh, a part of our lives that we dedicated to the film. And, and where uh, did you travel to? What areas uh, did you travel to when you were on location? We, we shot you... everything in Budapest. Oh, so everything in was in Budapest. Yes. I believe and I can't, I, I'm sorry that my homework isn't really thorough because I couldn't remember. <laughs> um, there was an article and I don't know if it was Makeup Artist Magazine or if it was The Artisan, mm -hmm. but it was an, it, I remember reading it that it not only was, you know, it Hellboy 2, but it was hell in production. And I don't mean that rudely, mm -hmm. but you had a lot of, uh, it seemed like there was a lot of challenges that you were up against besides creating the, the characters, that there was also background and, 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 the, and doing the makeups in Budapest. Is that true? Did I read an article on that? Yeah, uh, th that's that's pretty accurate. That describes pretty much how the process was for, for all of the people involved. Spectral Motion was the principal company involved, and there were also several uh, uh, European companies who contributed. So all told, we had 40 characters to design. Spectral Motion had 15 of them. And uh, it was, you know, everything was born from a crucible. It, you know, whenever Guillermo comes to us with his ideas, and uh, which are very grand, you know. Uh, in Guillermo this, del Toro. Guillermo del Toro, our director. The, our director. Yeah. Pan's uh, Labyrinth. Pan's Labyrinth, Blade, Blade Two, the first Hellboy. Right. Chronos, mm -hmm. you know, the, the list goes on. Um, but he definitely has a following. Absolutely. Absolutely. A huge following. Uh, but but your, your observation is very astute that it was a very emotional kind of film because he's a very emotional kind of director. You know, he, he imparts a great deal of, of spirit and energy uh, emotional energy into the characters and into the designs themselves. Uh, his uh, his edict for us was to abandon 
convention when we were coming to the table to design the characters. It's kind of nice in a way it to is. abandon convention. It's wonderful. It's just so terrific to to be given that challenge initially, right away from the from the very start. And uh, he he urged us to use as our reference material um, medieval engravings. You know. Um, Stuff that you wouldn't imagine that you would. Are those want. documented in history books, medieval engravings? Is that yes. how you look to find yeah, those yeah. sources? There are collections of mm -hmm. medieval art. Right. Uh, you know, all sorts of. You can look online to find anything now. You can Google now anything, yeah, right? Exactly. So, so we found lots of reference material. He provided us with some, and and then the other thing that he told us to do, which also added another layer of, of pride, ownership, and and emotion, is uh, that he told each. He told me to tell all of the artists involved to bring some of their own uh, aesthetic into the character designs. So he well, that's really kind of a gift, it's isn't wonderful. it? Because they're not being dictated to, exactly. and I don't mean to use the word dictated, but there yeah. are. We know there are some directors and some productions that say it's this, it's that, yeah. nothing else, and you have Absolutely. you're kind of bound to that idea, which is part of our jobs is, is to be the person that helps collaborate Absolutely. those ideas. But when somebody kind of cuts the ropes loose a little bit, that's a gift. So it is, that's it great. It's a gift, and it's a rare gift. So and, what uh, did you, what were the attributes that you brought to to that? Well, for my part, uh, my involvement obviously was to oversee the entire production uh, at Spectral Motion, the pre-production, uh, which was huge. Huge. <laughs> was oh, no, I'm just just you saying it. I can yeah. see it's huge. Yeah, it's, it's, it was a big job. But then every individual artist who was involved with the actual sculpting, uh, the the creation of the characters under our roof, they participated in a way that they're usually not allowed to, which is that you know to to be allowed to to put their own slant on things and put their own flavor into it a little bit. And that's such a wonderful thing for an artist, you know. It is. That's part of being an artist is, is knowing that you can, you know, if someone says do a straight line and you decide to go out of the line a little bit that you can do that yeah. and, and yeah. that's nice. It, it is nice. It's great to work with Guillermo because he, he respects that. He understands how artists' minds work. He understands how he's going to get the maximum effect. You know, these people are in the business for 20, 30 years. They're very experienced. They're very proficient artists. Why not trust them a little bit, you know? Uh, many times we're approached to, to come up with designs that are are sort of, we're, we're being told how to do it, you know, right. by probably by people who don't have nearly as much experience as some of our artists do. And, you know, it's about respect, really, isn't it? I mean, it is about respect. Yeah. And speaking of respect, it says a lot about you, not only your company and your body of work, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is how... How do, you, how do you get to meet and to work and to collaborate you know, with Guillermo del Toro? How, how, does that, how does that book open up for you? I mean, how did that happen? It, it happened, it was a... Because he obviously respects you is why well, I use the word respect. Thanks, yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things where Guillermo has, has tremendous respect for people who, who have a creative ability. Because he's creative, you know. He he came from the world that we we are now in. He he used to be a makeup designer. Uh, he he owned a creature shop in in Mexico. So he understands the process thoroughly. Uh, and he we, uses it to the full extent, absolutely. which yes. is uh, which is wonderful. And not to interrupt you, I want to hear this, but. One of the great things that uh, I was telling Aaron Kruger, a mutual friend of ours, this last night is I watched Pan's Labyrinth. I didn't see it on the main screen, but I saw it at home on a beautiful screen. And then I watched it once on my own. Then I watched it with the commentary. Great movie. <laughs> and then I watched it again with the commentary, which gave me... I had three different perspectives. Now, now I got to tell you, I am hooked when I watch movies that allow the commentary to talk about, because what Pan's Labyrinth and that commentary did, uh, Guillermo did, was he exposed me to how he lights it, how he emotes it, how he post-produces it, and all 
of the angles and why he decides there's a blue filter and the mood with the little girl coming down and you know the lights that he uses to emote a feeling and how he uses you know like the unspoken art of light and filterage and things of that sort to touch us emotionally it doesn't always have to be words right. that you know touch our heart or make us tearful we can actually experience the film process and and feel cold or fear or happy or sad and then when I was finished with the commentary I then watched the movie on its own and it, for a makeup artist you know and I'm not a prosthetic makeup artist I mean I I'm a basic prosthetic person I can do little pieces but I'm not a sculptor and designer it really gave me a real uh, bigger understanding it broadened my peripheral mm -hmm. to how that all incorporates and I'm hoping that Hellboy 2 you know will also offer a commentary like that because then it, it, it'll enrich the the film watching process yes yeah so it, it does Hellboy mm -hmm. 2 does have a, a great commentary track mm -hmm. by Guillermo great and that's the most entertaining, sometimes the most entertaining part of the experience, once you've enjoyed the film, to listen to what was behind each frame of the film. What he's thinking. Yeah, what was he thinking? What was he you know? thinking? And and you know when you and look why at, is he so specific about? Oh, he's you know one specific. one lash less than two and Absolutely. one hole smaller than bigger. Why yeah. is the specificness of his desire, you know, that specific? You know, yeah. you know Tom Flounce was commenting that in the Angel of Death. You know, there were, you know, little holes that needed to be placed so that he could see. Mm -hmm. And they asked if they could do five, and Tom Flount said, no, you can do one. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so they had to cover up the other, yes. you know, few and allow the one. And so right. that, you know, something that specific means that, you know, he's really gearing in there that there, there's a reason for either how he wants the character to move or how he wants the actor to feel within the character so they don't have that peripheral. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it was, but I found it very interesting that he was very specific. He, he is. There are no accidents in his films. You know, the, everything happens because he has pre-visualized it in his mind. He always says, before I start a film, I've already seen the whole film in my head. Wow, that's amazing. So it's incredible. It's, what, a, what a talent, you know, what a gift he has. Uh, which so is, let's let's know. let's find out how you how did you meet Guillermo? I met Guillermo while I was working uh, on on a film called Blade Two, mm -hmm. and Blade. What I did for for him on Blade Two was uh, was that the Wesley Snipes film? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's the second installment. The second installment the, of the Blade, that. Yeah, series. We don't say uh, sequels anymore, do we? We say no, installments. No, we say installments. Because Sounds fancy. It does. <laughs> <laughs> so I met him during that film. I designed the animatronics for the uh, Reaper characters. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very happy with the work that I did for him on that film. And I was working for another gentleman at the time. Uh, so I traveled to set. Our relationship became very, very firm and very close. And, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the fact that I spoke Spanish helped a little bit because we're both sure Mexican, that? you know. And that, that although it doesn't carry as, as much weight as his respect for, for artistry. No, but it is a communication that, oh, absolutely. that's yeah. connecting. Sure, absolutely. So. So we became very good friends, uh, and we have remained very good friends throughout the years, and uh, that's how, how we met. After he, he saw the work that I did for him on, on Blade Two, he felt that it was a good time to offer me the job of Hellboy. You know, he brought the script to me and, and said, you wanna, wanna do a movie on your own? And I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hello. So, what is it, tell me what that felt like when someone hands you a script and how you place yourself to sit and turn through the pages and read the script through. Do you read it through once, all the way through, or are you making notes from the first time you open the pages when you're reading it? My process is I like to read a script, and as I'm reading it, I isolate the things that I believe uh, would involve our work. Right. Right away, you know. And at the same time, I, I'm getting the overview of the whole project as I'm reading it. Um, but, but, you know, our process is very focused and very, very uh, localized. You know, we, we, we do have to extract what's in that script and start thinking about it immediately. How is that going to look? What is, what is the... Because uh, there's going to be so many changes and it's yeah. going gonna, gonna, to yes. gonna have its own development and yeah. metamorphosis from the moment that it's on the page mm -hmm. till Guillermo says, roll camera. The screen. Yeah. 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 So, and even in post-production, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, th there are 
there are definitely always little tweaks happening, you know. So we have to start the wheels turning immediately. So, so when I look at a script, that's what I start thinking about. What are the possibilities of each one of these effects, you know, and, and how, how is the best, uh, what's the best methodology for achieving these, these characters? Uh, what were the first wheels that were turning as you were reading Hellboy 2? Wink, Mr. Wink. Mr. Wink? was the biggest thing that I started immediately that thinking about. That was the uh, kind of the nemesis monster with the, yeah. with the, with the chained, yes. you know, yeah, the, pulverizing fist that Hellboy really finds that he's up against somebody that could really, excuse the expression, kick his ass. Yes. You know, um, yeah. yeah. That was, that was a Kind great... of with the baby scene. That yeah. was so touching, yeah, you know, to mm -hmm. hold a newborn baby in your hand while you're fighting this, yeah. this beast that's going to, could possibly, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, kick Hellboy's ass. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so let's talk about Wink a little bit and what was, what were you first thinking when you read the script? What came, what, how did that develop? It, it struck me that this had to be something pretty spectacular because of the way of the descriptions in the script and also because of discussions that I'd had with Guillermo initially. Uh, you know, he wanted to push the envelope, push the limits of what, what has already been established in animatronics. And he also said, you know, this, this not only has to be better than what we've seen in animatronics, but it has to be better than the digital work that has been you know, in the industry for years now. Because he wanted to, uh, to, to celebrate what we do. He wanted this to be a showpiece of what the ultimate, uh, the ultimate achievement can be like. And, and Mr. Wink, and the Angel of Death, by the way, also. We're gonna talk about the Angel that. of Death. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they, are, they are the incarnation of Guillermo's love for our craft and our art, and his, his desire for that never to go away for more and more people to see what can be achieved practically and how, how wonderful it, it can be to have something that's right in front of you, shooting in front of the camera on the day. You know? On the day. Yeah. What the day. was the limit? If, you, if you're saying to me that you were going to go past the limits that are already established, when you, when you and Guillermo were collaborating about the character Wink, is it Wink? With Wink. A, Mr. Wink. Wink. Yeah. Mr. Wink. Mm -hmm. What was the border that you had to cross to get past what was already established to go beyond? What, what was the challenge that took you beyond that to where you could honor that, let's go past what's already been established in animatronics? Well, the character had to have palpable emotion. He had to be able to express with his face and his, his body language what Guillermo wanted that character to convey. Um, More so in the design of the character as the opposed to just adding it later. Right, exactly. Right. In the design of the character. He wanted all the little nuances that, that you and I take for granted when we're watching somebody talk, for example. Um, every little element that, that makes up the animatronics of Wink's face is another step in the direction of breaking through the barrier of what has been established. If you take a look at the behind the scenes reel on, I'm going on to, Hellblade trust me. Too, you'll see some of the expressiveness of the face and it's really wonderful to watch those those moments because within the context of the film you're really not thinking about it. You're, no, because you're, you're watching the action. Exactly, you're, watching you're like the watching the arm come out and yes. the Hellboy roll over and yes. the baby getting picked up but and coming. That's, you know. that's good too. Yeah. So there was that. There was also the, the, the sheer massive size of Wink. He, he was supposed Jeez. to be almost eight feet tall. Mm -hmm. uh, the suit without Brian Steele in it. Brian Steele's the so actor. So Brian Steele was the actor yeah. playing Wink. Mm -hmm. without, without Brian in it, the suit weighed 120 pounds. Holy Enormously moly. heavy. So Brian trained for months and months to make this suit move naturally, to be able to fight in the suit, to be able to do all of the action sequences that were required. How does he train and how do you train? Do you make like a prototype suit or just the weight is added on and then he has someone that helps him choreograph? Are you involved in the choreograph of the... No, no, uh -huh. no, no. That's Brian's department. He's a performer, and he's a wonderful performer. Right. He doesn't need... He doesn't need... Right, I didn't no. know if it was because no. of the suit and the things that you were participating in right. that no, no, way. No, no, no. Uh, the way he trains for it is he, he wears kind of like a rigging vest and hangs weights off of, the, off of the vest. He puts big, heavy ankle weights on his feet, and he carries dumbbells around, and then he parades up and down uh, a parking lot in the middle of summer with a coat on so that he's sweating and getting acclimated to the whole oh my process. Goodness, of, yeah. It's it's grueling. It's grueling. grueling. And yet he makes it look effortless. So 
thanks to him, thanks to Guillermo's uh, aesthetic and contributions creatively, and thanks to the team, that character is, is in my humble and honest opinion, it's amazing. It really is. It's amazing. I'm going to be looking at it from a different point of view <laughs> after our interview. Now, yeah. how about the, the, what was the character, I don't think a character, but the, you know, the, 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 the vine in the forest mm -hmm. that starts to overtake the city that comes through the under, you know, comes through this, you know, when the little pod rolls into the, the gates of the street yes. and hits the water and all of a sudden now it's, you know, it's, it's born right. and it's coming. Was that a process that you participated in too? into that? No, no, we didn't have anything to do with that. The character was called the Elemental. The Elemental. Yes. Thanks for helping me. I, sure. I'm remembering some of them, but there's a lot of characters. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Elemental. Uh, the Elemental was uh, is a forest god mm -hmm. and uh, the last of its kind, as, as is uh, noted in the film. And it was designed with Guillermo's design team, uh, his own in-house uh, creative team, and the double negative uh, digital people did, did the character. Okay, let's talk about, um, I want to touch base with Abe Sapien, mm -hmm. Angel of Death, mm -hmm. and Chamberlain. Sure. But I'm going to take a small break because um, we're going to take a little bit of a break. We'll come back with the second segment with Mike Elizalde with uh, MUATV.com, and we'll come back. We have some more questions. Hi, this is Kelsey Fry with MUATV.com, and we're here with Mike Elizalde, Academy Award nominee for Hellboy 2, with his company and his team on Spectral Motion. Motion. Thank you for that help. Sure. I don't know why I have the word vision in my mind, so I... we're a visionary company. I, so <laughs> I appreciate you being kind. That I'm sure. sorry I made that mistake. Not at all. So we left off um, talking about Wink and him being, at least from your point of view, the most challenging of the characters as you were reading through the script. Um, what character then came up next for you? I know Doug Jones, who's been in Hellboy and Hellboy 2, we interviewed him yesterday, and Tom Flouts, they work together on, you know, and just kind of incorporating the makeup artist and character and actor, you know, relationship, which I think is, uh, they expressed that that was important when you're kind of deaf and blind and you're on stilts and you have all this going on, you need that, you know, that support system. You're kind of like a, an all-day creative nurse in a, in a way to make sure the actor is comfortable. And Doug Jones played Abe Sapien, the Angel of Death, and Chamberlain. Correct. So let's talk about his characters and come up, you know, tell me how they kind of opened up into the script for you. Well, that, that was the, the next challenge that I saw in the script, was the, the character, the Angel of Death. Um, it was uh, described as, you know, a, a, a faceless uh, harbinger of doom with wings. And the wings had eyes on them, uh, seven eyes per wing that, that blinked and looked around and, and followed, followed people as they, as they moved uh, around the set. So that was another, I, you know, it occurred to me that that would be a very big challenge for us to try to create. And, and again, Guillermo insisted that everything on the character be practical. He, he didn't want the wings to be digital, which was kind of my first thought when I was reading the script. I thought, well, maybe the wings will be digital, the character will be designed by us, and there will be digital wings with these eyes. And, and, and Guillermo said, no, there, it's got to be practical. I want them to be real, you know. God now, bless what you, do you, Yeah, and what do you think um, is that difference, even though maybe an, an audience member may not really understand the difference between what, what doing them digitally versus doing them practically, how could we explain to the audience what that difference is, even though it may just be something that Guillermo 
feels in his heart. Is, is there a radical difference in how it really expresses itself to the audience? I, I, I believe there is, and I think that Guillermo has an extremely trained eye. You know, he's very sensitive to what, what makes a character look convincing and what doesn't. And, and one of the things that he believes, uh, which he has learned over the years, is that in, in digital creations, it's very difficult to mimic actual physics. That's the big problem, you know, that's the, 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 the real challenge that digital designers face, animators and, and renderers. They face the challenge of creating something that doesn't exist and making it look like it does exist within the boundaries of our world of physics. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, to emulate that. Is that why they will sometimes, and I'm just guessing now, that they're little dots and they'll do human beings or actors or stunt people and they'll put the dots, reference points for digital, they'll have them do a lot of activity, you know, and then they have all that kind of stored as information and then when they create the digital design then they just apply that and kind of push it on over to that individual that did those movements, is that, is yeah, that why? That's that's a big reason, they, they want to be able to capture the actor's performance and that's why they call that technology motion capture. Would that uh, be what, excuse me for just asking, I know we're talking about help, but would, would that be what Benjamin Buttons was when they did Brad Pitt's face over the, when he played and he does that pose in the mirror and he's got the younger body, would that be what that was? Yes, yeah, that, that was a digital effect that was done with another actor, uh -huh. and then Brad's face was aged and then placed on that actor's body. And uh, is that what digitally. that's called? It, it's a it's a it's a uh, uh, a version of motion capture. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's the technology uh, that, that helps animators make their their creations look more lifelike. But still, uh, subconsciously, there are elements that are that are either not there or overdone, which make it look not real. And, and that's what Guillermo always locks into. He wants the most absolutely realistic version of it to be in his film, uh, to convince the audience that what they're looking at actually exists. Uh, so that was, that was uh, the Angel of Death was, was another great challenge for us. And, and I think a greater challenge than Mr. Wink. I, they're probably about equal, you know. In, in, Can you tell us the, the challenges that you came up with uh, with the Angel of Death? And I just want to ask, as I was thinking about it, does the seven eyes represent something specific, or was it just seven eyes? That's something you'd have to ask Guillermo. Okay. Because I'm not privy to that information. Okay. I just was curious. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's just the the disarming nature of, of walking into something and looking at its countenance and not seeing anything that 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 reflects back any emotion or any kind of any feedback, you know. Instead, the eyes are, are moved away from the face and they're on these massive wings. Yeah. So it's very overwhelming and very, you know, intimidating in, in some ways uh, to see that. Uh, and it's kind of uncomfortable. I remember watching sure. the character and trying to keep my eye on the, on the character's mainframe, but also trying to catch where the eye's gonna do something that I needed to watch what they were doing. I was wondering if they were doing something weird because I was like I wanted to watch what the wings were doing and yet the, the character was so massive I wanted to watch what the character was doing yeah. so I, I felt like I'll see it twice and I'll be able to kind of focus on both areas. Well when you do see it it, it is uh, a larger than life creature and and you are you are drawn to look at the wings because the wings are looking at you. Right. you know? So it's it's a it's a very engaging character in that way. Uh, but but it was a, a great challenge to make the wings themselves. Also, the character it's, uh, the, it was a turnkey character for us. We did the design work for it with Guillermo. Uh, we did the costume work. All of the costumes were, was done in spectral motion, and uh, we designed the animatronic wings as well. Uh, so everything that you see that is the Angel of Death came out of our shop, and um, the wings were a particular challenge because Doug Jones, who weighs probably all of 125 pounds so maybe. wet, maybe. <laughs> I saw um, him, he's very, yeah. very thin and yes. tall and yeah. wavy, which is yes. probably a, a plus he's with a, the character. He's a very thin person. Mm -hmm. um, to put a 40 pound pack on his back and, and have him be able to negotiate the movements of the wings and still generate this beautiful, elegant performance 
is is amazing, you know, that, that he was able to pull that off. Yeah, there was a grace as the character yeah. kind of entered into the scene and presented, you know, himself or herself. I don't know if it's a yeah. male or female character. Yes. Who knows what an, an angel? Who knows what an angel is, right? Yes, exactly. So I saw that, and they also spoke, and I believe that. Uh, I don't know if it was Chamberlain or Angel of Death. Were there stilts involved and a lot of radio packs that he had to wear? Can we talk about that a little bit, that, that design? Yeah, the Chamberlain is the one who, well, they both wore stilts. They both uh, wear stilts. Yeah, uh -huh. That must be very difficult. They're, they're more like like giant Blocks. 1980 platform shoes. You know? <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> so so uh, we, we paid a little homage to, you know, the disco, the, the fever. disco fever. right? Yeah. Uh, but, but Doug wore these big, giant platform shoes, which we referred to his stilts uh, underneath both the Angel of Death costume and the Chamberlain costume to, to augment his height, you know, give him a little more uh, of a, a bigger than life kind of feeling. Um, and, and it was the, the Chamberlain who wore the radio or the, uh, the battery packs around right. his waist to operate the animatronics in his head, uh, the, the finger movements on the, on the Chamberlain, those were all actuated by servo motors and the arms were actually puppeteered by Doug underneath the, the costuming. Um, so, so you're combining radio frequency, mechanics, if, if I'm saying it incorrectly, please feel free to correct me, mechanics, and puppeteering. Yes. Uh, were there any additional uh, added elements to that that were working with uh, the Hellboy 2 characters? Yeah, makeup effects. Makeup uh, effects. So in addition to all of those technologies, that techniques that you mentioned, we also used makeup around the actor's mouth so that we could use the actor's performance. Uh, so really, here's another place where Guillermo said, we're going to use all of the technologies that have been established in one character. Everything, you know. That's fantastic. Everything but stop motion. I mean, you know, everything that, 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 that we create. Uh, so, so it really puts it, puts it on a big showcase, you know, on a, on a big uh, pedestal as, as a creation that we are very proud of and also as a performance piece, you know. So. Uh, yeah, it, it, it basically no, pulled out all the stops and said, use every trick in the, in the book. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, Angel of Death, what kind of research, what, did it also come from a medieval kind of a historic character? Was there, is there a background you can share with us on how the creation of the Angel of Death came about? Well, the Angel of Death is, you know, the, there are a lot of old engravings that have, that depict angels and demons, some of them with, with eyes somewhere else other than, than their faces. Uh, but this was Guillermo's idea. This was his, his concept that he came up with for a, a film that he was hoping to make a few years ago. Uh, this character that he had in his, in, in, in his film had eyes on its wings. He didn't get to use it on, on that occasion, so he saved it, he pulled saved it out of it. his bag of tricks this, and used it for, for Hellboy 2. Uh, it's a very good effect, you know. Uh, so that was the origin of the Angel of Death. Uh, the, the sculptor who, who worked on the Angel of Death, Norman Cabrera, brought a lot of the design uh, elements into play. Uh, the filigree chest piece, the, you know, the, the, the way that the head was shaped. And then Guillermo came to the shop. Uh, actually, Norman had sculpted a face and a nose and, and you know, sort of these, these uh, sunken eyes. And Guillermo came and said, no, the, the, the face should be completely blank. There shouldn't be anything on the face below the, the opening of the nose. No eyes, no brows, just just nothing. Just a bony plate. It's death. You know, it's it's not something that you should be able to relate to or identify. You know, uh, as, as something that you can communicate with. Um, so, so I read in an article. Excuse me for interrupting. That during the design, that Guillermo came in and changed the eye shape yes. on the wings as well. That they were designed a particular way and then he came in and collaborated with the eyes being different. Then that, is that true? Guillermo's a very hands-on yes. kind of director and, and which is great for us because Well he was not, in makeup effects. How could course, you not? I mean absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. how could you not come in and just go, I want it yeah. you know, that way yeah. or this it's, way. It's perfect because then you're not second guessing mm -hmm. what he's looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he just He does guides. Yeah, he's the leader. Exactly. He's the leader. He's a director, yeah. He's, he's very, very good at it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're fortunate to to have that kind of understanding, you know, to, to have a director who has the knowledge, the ability, and and the, the creativity to to create the, the, the wonderful things that, that we're, you know, blessed to, to bring to life for him. So Do you find I mean I can't remember that I know. I think maybe there's probably a few occasions. 
where makeup artists have crossed over to be directors. I mean, that's a yeah. very interesting, uh, I mean, I know that would be a Guillermo de Toro interview, but I'm just saying that doesn't commonly happen where someone, you know, rises into the makeup effects area or in makeup artistry and then transitions into a directorship. Sure, so, yeah, it, it doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen. It does uh, happen. You know, I think Toro, it's, uh, mm -hmm. Steve Norrington was another Steve uh, Norrington. guy who started out in, in the makeup artistry. And and uh, Jim Cameron, you know he. Jim he's, Cameron, he's an I didn't know that. Artist first before a director. I did not and, know that. Yeah, that's and and you know the 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 reason that that Cameron's films are so beautiful to watch is because of that because he is an artist before uh, he is a filmmaker. So you know not not that that, that there is a separation. No, but it but, but combines the two elements yes, together. Exactly. That's really amazing. I didn't know. I just kind of got a history lesson there. That was good. <laughs> now, Abe Sapien. I mean, how can you not kind of have a crush on him? He's <laughs> he's romantic. Yes. You know, he falls in love in Hellboy 2 with the princess. He steps in and is willing to take his life, yeah, you know, yeah. save the princess. Well, he's um, a hero. He's intelligent. He's yes. sensitive. He's beautiful. You he's know? beautiful. He does because he kind of grows on you. His yeah. really oversized eyes and the largeness of him. And, you know, are these areas of his suit, are they practical? These little um, kind of what, I'm not the gills, but it looks like these little shapes that kind of shape, you know, maybe, yeah. like, I don't want to say scales, but maybe they're scale-like, but right. they have kind of an amphibious right. effect He's to them. Right, fins, clear, clear fins mm -hmm. all over his body. Mm -hmm. uh, he does have the gills that, that undulate and, yeah. and, and move as he's breathing. Um, uh, everything on Abe is practical, with the exception of the eye blinks mm -hmm. and some of the facial expressions. Uh, everything that, that you see him say or any mouth uh, emotions that, that come through, that's all Doug's performance. Uh, the, the, um, the way that that character evolved uh, was that, I guess I should go back and, and tell you how we did Please. the first version of Abe. Please do. Uh, the, there were very few scenes in the first movie where Abe Sapien was seen without a shirt, just a couple. So we, we uh, Steve Wang designed a makeup for Doug's body that we actually glued onto Doug, and when I say we, I mean Tom Flouts and Simon Weber and, and the team that was assigned to Abe. But uh, they, they glued the pieces onto Doug's body, and then they painted Doug's body to blend with the pieces, painted his skin, and that was done over a period of about six and a half, seven hours. Very long process. Long um, process. Yeah. And, and Doug would have to endure the removal process of having the paint taken Sometimes off. Sometimes the removal process night. is worse it's, than yeah, the application. It's difficult. It's I mean, difficult. You, think done, you know, they call they call that's a wrap on, on set. No, and I, you're still not finished. You got to go in and, and get the makeup on. Right. Uh, so so. I'm privy to the removal. I've had some wonderful little small jobs in removing, and even sometimes I've worked with Matthew Mungle on Little yeah. Britain and mm -hmm. fat suits and things oh, like. Great, and great I, stuff. yeah, I'm just saying yeah. that the removal process. You think it's over and. And you have, and the thing is, you can't rush through the removal. Yep. You have to be delicate because some do. of those solvents, if you try to do that, you'll wear away the skin, and then it's too sensitive to do it the next exactly. day. Exactly. Or you, you know, you don't want to damage an actor's skin. You know, you want to be soft. So I, I very much understand the removal process. Well, in in keeping, you know, in being sensitive to that issue, as I was reading the script, another thing that came came to the forefront of my thoughts was. Wow, Abe's in this movie without his shirt on a lot more than he was in the first movie. So I, I, I thought that we should redesign the way Abe was done. And uh, from what I learned on, on uh, Rise of the Silver Surfer, applying the Silver Surfer makeup to Doug on that film, it was great the way that that, that worked out because we actually built a body skin suit that went over Doug, Doug's body and, and glued the Silver Surfer appliances onto the suit. Uh, so that at the end of the day, it was just about removing the makeup off his face and unzipping him from the suit, and he was done. So I used the same idea uh, in creating the, the second iteration of Abe. It was also a good opportunity to give Abe just a little bit more of a, of a, a hunky, beefy musculature. You know, he's a swimmer. He's, he's a, a 
an athlete. You know? Sleek. Very sleek. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we built up Doug's musculature a little bit more, very, very marginally. Yeah, because so Nero, would, yeah. yeah, he didn't want it to, to look to be like that's not Abe Sapien exactly, from the exactly. first one, right? He right. wanted it to be but, so noticeable. No, no, no. But in, in fact, it's not as noticeable unless you, you really look for it. I didn't notice it. There yeah. you go. So that, that's good. We did our job right. Yeah. <laughs> um, apparently, so, you have. Apparently, we have. <laughs> So um, it, it, was a, it was a shorter process to get him in, shorter to get him out, and Doug didn't have to go home wearing paint because he did do that on the first movie. He, he volunteered. He said, look, guys, we want to save some time tomorrow on the application and get me out of here earlier tonight. I will wear the paint. Tomorrow we can just touch it up. Wow. Trooper Doug Jones. Yes. Go Dougie. Yeah. That's, that's so. really, you know, uh, an art form in itself yeah. to be yeah. that way. You know, I just, and not to, I'm not really here to talk about myself, but I, I'm just letting you know that I understand when I worked with Ken Diaz on the Rafe Fines Red Dragon, you know, we, you know, before all of the Tinsley transfers and all kind of yeah. the innovative stuff, you know, we were working with Ken Diaz's designs and templates for that whole, you know, dragon, red dragon tattoo all down the body. And it would take, you know, six of us about, you know, eight or nine hours because we were hand shading and tooling and right. doing all that. You know, but at the, uh, you know, at the end of the night, you know, taking that off and having to come back the next morning and do, you know, we would, we would seal it and kind of ghost it out a little bit. So all we really had to come back and do was to kind of go back in and shade and strengthen some of the lines, you know, by hand and it would cut the time, you know, by a third. And that way Rafe wouldn't have to, you know, sit, you know, or, you know, be in makeup for as long. And they shot it all in like one chunk of time, yeah. so it made it easier. So well, when actors yeah, I mean, do that, it's, it's really it's beneficial. Amazing. It's great. It's great. Well, Doug is just amazing. You know, he he is there because he understands that a job needs to get done. Right. It's not about him or his needs or his comfort. It's about what do we need to do to get this done efficiently, quickly, and make it look beautiful. He's with us, you know, yeah, he's part he of our team, you know, which is great because so many times you have to work against the grain. You yeah, know, you to, do. In order to get things done. And correctly. that's kind of part of our responsibility is yeah. not to make someone feel bad if they no, want to do it that not. way. We no, have no, to no. accommodate that kind of a comfort zone. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And yeah. that's that's why we're here. We're here to make the actors comfortable and make it look great for this for the set. Doug's here to make it look great for the set with us, you know. So he's he's great, you know, as as you mentioned, Ralph Fiennes is, is a great great tremendous actor who who uh, understands that there is a time-saving element in not in, in going the extra mile and in, in keeping part of the thing on and and it's a it's a tremendous and he's here isn't he in London yes. is that's he? an extra mile oh Doug, Doug yes, yeah yes, I'm just yes, saying yes, uh -huh. Doug Jones is here yes, you know here. and he has a following and he's supporting and yes. he's extremely excited for uh, both Amazing. you and Tom yeah. and so that's an extra mile too yes. to come and to be supportive that way and you know he had a long line of fans everybody was yeah. just so happy to see him he's, he's adored he yeah really he is. he's very much he's adored now Chamberlain let's talk about Chamberlain um, can we go through how the Chamberlain uh, not the Chamberlain but Chamberlain's concept came about and how you designed the Chamberlain well, that was one of the characters that, uh, well, uh, it, was, it was designed by a gentleman named Chet Zar, who is a very prolific uh, fine artist. He's, a, he's an oil painter uh, and has had a lot of success with his paintings. Um, he works with us on occasion, and in fact, quite a bit. And Guillermo loves his work. I mean, he has a couple of Chet's paintings, as do I. I, I love Chet's work myself. Uh, and uh, he told Chet, that he wanted the Chamberlain to be a kind of a, a he, he's an emissary to the throne. You know, he's he's kind of a, a bureaucrat. You know, uh, in this in this mythical world. Uh, so so he told Chet, look, I don't have any concepts for this guy, except for a, a rough drawing. So Guillermo showed that to Chet, and he said, I want you to take this and run with it. And Chet did. He wow. created this amazing thumb-headed, spindly-fingered, you know. Emissary that, that just was was a, a, a stunning character, you know. Just the, the the image of that character will always stay with me. I think it's really weird. It's so unusual, and it, it really is something that you would see in a in a nightmare, you know, in, in a strange sort of 
drug state. I don't know what, right. you know, but, but some, uh, op some opiate, some ex opiate experience. Yeah, right. opiate experience. You would see that character <laughs> right. and wake up going, ah, exactly. Right, and exactly. it would stay not with that I would you. Know. I, I've yeah. heard. Right? No, I know. We're not in, in, <laughs> implying that, but it just seems that in storytelling, the opiates always take you to some level of dream yes, state or yes, imaginary yes, yes. state that is, uh -huh. you know, way beyond. You know, like beyond even when reality. people have had morphine in surgery, yes. they go, "You have no idea the dream I had." Right. And the person right. and the character that was in my dream, so yeah. that's why I use that reference. Absolutely, and and so you know the the Chamberlain was another turnkey character for us. Design, costume design, everything that you see on that character came out of Spectral, and uh, you know we're we're so proud of of everything that came out of what Guillermo allowed us to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, are there any other characters you would like to touch base on? Uh, you know, there. How they're, about the guy? Um, and I might have forgot his name. That the Beth Mora Goblin. The the Goblin. Yeah. The Beth he Mora wants Goblin. something shiny. Yeah. Shiny. <laughs> Give me something shiny. Isn't that great? I love yeah. that. Yeah. Shiny. That's all yeah. he cares about. You know. Um, but that that character was designed by Matt Rose mm -hmm. and and Chad Waters. Uh, I they had a little uh, sculpture. Guillermo and I went over to, to Matt's and Chad's place. Uh, before, long before Hellboy 2 got started. And we, we saw this little sculpture that Matt had done and Guillermo looked at it and said, oh, this is wonderful, you know, I want, to, I want this to be in the movie, you know, and, and, and so it became one of the designs for the film. Um, and, and it's played by John Alexander, who's an amazing guy. You know, he's, he's uh, been in, in Greystoke, Legend of Tarzan, uh, he's been in... Um, uh, is he a small person no, inside no. that or...? No, he's, he's, a, he's about five foot four, five foot five, uh, but he's very strong and muscular, very slender. He plays gorillas a lot. I guess any time in, in, in the last 10 or 15 years, maybe 20 years, that you've seen a gorilla in a movie, it's probably John Alexander. He's our main gorilla guy? He's our main gorilla guy. Uh, he's I love that. He's a motion expert, you know, so uh, he knows, he knows to, how to endure the rigors of wearing a, a suit for hours and hours, and he's also very athletic and very strong, uh, so he was perfect for this role. Uh, it, he appears to have no legs in the role. Uh, yeah, he doesn't. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was wondering. You see, I was yeah, yeah, thought no, maybe it was a small person that was playing the uh, role in that. No, uh, John's legs are disguised in the in the little cart that's that's on the back of the of the troll that he that yeah. Carries so he around. could like he could lay out and extend his legs yeah. out. Uh -huh. And then it, it looks like his body is perpendicular to the ground, but it's not really. He's slanted back, and the the, the body that you're seeing is a fake body, obviously. And, um, smoke and mirrors, illusion. smoke and mirrors. Beautiful illusion, it worked so well. I want to ask you a couple of, uh, how about the wig work? Um, the Asian samurai influence for uh, Hellboy. Who, by the yes. way, how can, how, can, how can one not fall in love with Hellboy? I mean, he's, first of all, he's a hunk. Second of all, he's, you know, he smokes and yeah. he drinks. And let me tell you something, you're going to find this funny, but I'm watching the movie, and I'm watching him get drunk with, you know, Abe Sapien, and I'm going, Hey, wait a minute, Hellboy drinks the beer I like. It's Takati <laughs> <Tecati Tecati>. Light. <laughs> no, Takati Light. Takati Light. Uh -huh. Takati Light. That's what I like. And That's you know, Takati Light is not a common beer. You know, they, they don't have it in every store. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just saying that for camera, but I'm, I said to Aaron, we're on the plane, I go, Hellboy's drinking my favorite beer. It's, I had to get really close. I go, it's, it's Takati Light. <laughs> so I wonder if Guillermo just threw that in because it's his favorite beer or whatever. Because I found interesting that that beer was selected because yeah. it's yeah. Mexican beer and it's a light beer, right, you know. Right, right, right. But, you know, he smokes and yeah. he drinks and he's romantic and he's sexy and he's about to become a father, which obviously, I mean, I've got away from the wig question, but that obviously will lead us to Hellboy 3. Mm -hmm. So we know that Hellboy 3 because how can you not see yeah. Hellboy's son? Or daughter, yeah. we don't know yet. Well, we don't hoping. know. Could be twins. No. Oh, that's right. It's twins. It's twins. It's twins. That's right. I remember the end. It's twins. So we don't know yet. But let's talk about the wig work and how, who was involved uh, and how did uh, you come up with the wigs? Well, the, the the hairstyle for Hellboy was established in the first film, mm -hmm. and it was uh, created by Rick Baker's team mm -hmm. uh, at Cinovation, and I, the the wig work was done by Sylvia Nava. And uh, when when the project moved over to, to our under our roof, uh, we we inherited Sylvia, thank goodness, and and her wonderful talents, and also Diane Sue, Diane Yu, excuse me. Uh, Diana is uh, someone who works with Sylvia all the time. They're both brilliant wig makers, amazing hair tie experts, ventilators, uh, ventilators, punchers, punchers, anything that has to do with hair, hair, they do it and they make it look 
more real than real. I mean, it's just amazing. Were those, the work was that, that a punch do. work on Hellboy's hair, or was that a, a, no, that was a, a lace? ventilated wig? A ventilated wig. Yes. Because uh -huh. just slick and tight and beautiful, beautiful. and he beautiful. rolls around yeah. all over the place and durable. And it's, it's durable, <laughs> it's exactly. Durable. Yeah. Well, kudos to all the uh, the ladies and yes. all those involved in yeah, the yeah, hair yeah. work. Amazing work, absolutely. Mike, one of the last questions, I know you are off to go do some work for Michael Key and the, the convention, and I so appreciate your patience and your diligence to make this interview happen. Not I will appreciate it, and I know the audience will. My last question for you is, when you wake up on the day that you must begin all of the collaborative work and taking the lead with your company, and your team and your employees, what what do you feel and how how do you begin that day? I just want to know what it's like to wake up knowing that when you open your eyes you go, okay, let's go. How, how does how does that how does that happen for you? You know, it's 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 thrilling. It's absolutely exciting, and it's the reason why I got involved in this business uh, to take on those challenges. So. That first day is always unbelievable. It's always very exciting. Energy is very high. The creative ideas are just flowing. Uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful feeling to, to be in that position. Uh, it's it's uh, tremendously exciting. You know, we we, we are so fortunate to have uh, working with us some of the most amazingly talented people in Hollywood, uh, and uh, I'm so fortunate to be the guy that they turn to for answers sometimes. You know, it's it's. It's a very humbling experience. Well, I want you to know your peers, you know, feel that you are well deserving of That's this opportunity, nice. that your body of work is not just about Hellboy 2, that your body of work, you know, accumulated to being recognized at Hellboy 2. And I think it's really exciting to not only meet you, but to also see the admiration that's around you that maybe you don't get to see from your peers. That's really sweet. Uh, Thank you. It's not I sweet, you know. It's, I mean, it's. I appreciate you saying sweet, but it's factual, you know. And uh, I, I hope that. Are you taking your wife to the academies with you? Absolutely. That's great. You'll do Absolutely. the red carpet. You bet. Yes. And uh, I really hope that you have a great time. Thank you. I'm not going to say anything other than I wish all of the nominees the best of luck. Great. And great. I want you to have a really great time. And I hope that maybe if you don't mind, if it's if it's cool someday, maybe we could come visit, you know, that. your yeah. shop, I would love and that we could just different. maybe, you know, buy your guided tour, sure. get a little sense of spectral motion. The door's open to you. you that is a pleasure. Kelsey Fry with Mike Elizalde for MUATV.com. We thank you very much. We'll see you back.